I am here today with Elise Hooper to talk about her latest novel, Angels of the Pacific. I had the opportunity to meet and interview Elise uh, if I remember correctly, when she was in Missouri researching for her then upcoming novel, Fast Girls, and also promoting Learning to See. Am yes. I remembering that correctly? Yes, you are. I mean, what a different life that was. I was going to say the same thing. It seems so long ago <laughs> and a completely different lifetime. It really does. <laughs> But thank you for joining yeah. me today. Let's start by telling, if you would, uh, telling our listeners what your book is about. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's always good to see you. I wish, of course, it was back to in person, but we're, we're working with what we can do these days. Um, Angels of the Pacific is my new book, and it is about a group of U.S. Army nurses who are stationed in the Philippines at the outset of World War II and how their lives turn upside down because the same day that Pearl Harbor is bombed, uh, the Japanese Imperial Army begins an invasion of the Philippines. And there were lots of Americans on that on the, on the island. So um, this novel is really told over the course of that period from 1941, um, right, you know, before Christmas to um, when the Philippines are liberated in 1945. And so these women are on the front lines. They're the first ever real U.S. Army women to be serving on the front lines. They're the first group ever taken as prisoners of war. And all the while, um, well, it all sounds kind of grim in some ways, I want to emphasize that they all survive. So it's actually a really amazing story of perseverance and resilience and survival and hope more than anything. And, and they were also helped. Uh, I mean, a large part of their survival is definitely due to the support they got from their Filipino colleagues who are on the outside of the internment camp. And they go on to send in food and supplies. And, and really those that food and the supplies were made all the difference in many ways for the survival of these nurses. So, um, you know, it's also a great story of kind of international cooperation and, and everything. So um, this story was a real adventure for me. I knew very little about the Pacific theater until I began working on this book. Well, your books, um, this one included, tend to be based on the lives of real women in history and often ones that history has overlooked or forgotten in time. So your first novel, The Other Alcott, was based on May Alcott. Learning to See was about photographer uh, Dorothea Lange. Fast Girls was about the four track and field Olympians, um, Betty Robinson, Helen Stevens, and... Um, Louis Stokes, Tidy Pickett, they're a bunch. Yes. Yeah, they're a bunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> and of course, the Angels of the Pacific is the story of the, um, is it Angels of Bataan? Am I saying that correctly? That is how they were referred to um, when they're liberated and brought back from the war. They were a big propaganda effort, essentially, by the U.S. government um, as sort of U.S. womanhood surviving in, the, in these challenging conditions, um, sacrifice, all of that. But yes, so this is a novel based on these real women, the Angels of Bataan and their Filipino counterparts. However, um, unlike my past uh, three books, then, the, the main characters in this novel are fictional. I kind of created composite rather than really plucking several of the women who were Angels of Bataan out of history. I decided to kind of create my own cast of characters based on those women. Um, and that kind of allowed me a little bit of flexibility in some ways of, of creating a story that touches, you know, in, in a variety of different areas on, on um, the subject. So what do you think it is um, about the real stories that compel you to write novels about real women? And what was different about this group of women that you wanted to fictionalize the main characters, which you hadn't done in the past? Well, that's a good question. You know, I think in my in the case of my other books, um, these were women I really felt everyone needs to know these names. And, you know, Mae Alcott is obviously, you know, becoming, I'd say, better known because of her sister. And of course, Amy March, her fictional counterpart, is very well known. Dorothea Lange is um, well known within certain circles. And, and I would also argue her name is becoming more and more popular with recent um, exhibitions of her work. And um, the Olympians, I really kind of felt like, gosh, people need to know these women's names. They have such an amazing story and they're such unsung heroes. Um, 
in the case of the Angels of Bataan, I had didn't feel quite as necessary. You know, I didn't think that Red Harrington. I mean, I didn't feel that need to quite draw attention to this actual singular women of this story. And, and to be honest, this was a group of women who would have really, in most ways, shied away from that kind of attention. Mm -hmm. They really saw themselves as having just done their jobs and they didn't, they had very complicated feelings in many ways about the attention they received when they came home. Um, I think they carried a lot of survivor's guilt. They also carried a lot of trauma that, you know, in that era, trauma was something you didn't really deal with. And so um, that is actually a really interesting part of the story too, I think, is kind of how these women are expected to just arrive home and immediately start uh, saluting the flag and, and smiling for all the photographers. And they're not really ever allowed to process a lot of the complicated feelings they brought back. And, um, you know, a lot of them also died in obscurity, including um, a woman who many of the nurses and, and several of their military counter male military counterparts tried to promote and um, have acknowledged by MacArthur and the president. And, and these women were never granted a lot of that recognition. Um, so, so that's why I decided um, to kind of give the women, I think in some ways, a little bit of the grace they wanted, which was to recede a little bit and, and, um, then kind of build some fictional characters that would do these women justice, but that took almost the pressure off of the legacies of some of these individuals. You used to be a high school literature and history teacher. So I'm sure you know or have heard lots of interesting historical stories about women doing incredible things. So I'm curious how you choose which stories to devote a novel to, in particular, what it was about uh, the Angels of Bataan that sparked enough interest for you to devote the time and energy it takes to publish a novel about them. Right. Um, you know, this was a story I had in some ways been circling for a while in the sense that my grandfather uh, served in the Pacific during World War II. He was aboard the USS Missouri when MacArthur signed the peace treaty with the Japanese. He went into Tokyo with MacArthur. It was one of the first groups of Americans in the city. Um, they had to walk because the city streets were so destroyed. They couldn't even bring Jeeps in at that point. And my grandfather um, brought home a, a child's kimono that is hand sewn. It's beautiful. I should have I should have it in my office here to show you. Um, I'll put it on social media later. But that kimono has been in our family now for several generations. And um, it's kind of been niggling away at me, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to know more about my grandfather's service. Now, he never spent any time in the Philippines. But because of my interest in always telling stories about women whose stories have been overlooked, I knew that I wanted to focus my attention on World War II. And I also knew that the Pacific had many great stories that had been largely, um, you know, you know, not told as readily as Europe's stories, right? So, and given my location in Seattle, turning eastward felt like a really natural extension of my own sort of geography and everything. So I was doing my research and really um, as soon as I just found, you know, I'll say the Angels of Bataan, who are well a part of the historical record for anyone who's kind of looking, immediately I knew that these were my women because their story is amazing. And yet here in, when did I begin this book? 2018. I had never heard of them. Um, and I just felt that at that point, the world seemed like a really different place. And I was just captivated by, you know, this story of resilience and heroism and with everything we've gone through the last few years, I mean, nurses on the front line seem like a very relevant story and also just surviving tough times now has a whole new resonance that in many ways I could have done without sort of <laughs> this experience we've had to learn this the hard way. But um, while I was working on this book and in, in some cases that was during kind of the grimmest days of our lockdown that spring of 2020, uh, actually the nurses gave me a lot of comfort. I could, I could really look to their story as uh, people surviving hard times in really much more challenging circumstances than I was facing, certainly. 
And so really, you know, it's always a bit of kind of magic how I think you land on a story and how how its characters kind of resonate with you. And 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 this was one that its significance has really changed over the course of when mm. I started it to where we are right now. So that's actually kind of amazing. It really is. And that kind of is a great lead into my next question of whether you had a long list of potential books of stories that you've heard, or if it's more like panning for gold for that right magical story. But it really seemed to me in this case anyway, that it was more panning for gold and you like found your nugget with this. Right. Story. I think it is it for me. And I think for everyone, it's different, but um, it is kind of a panning for gold experience. And it's, it's a lot about chemistry. Just suddenly I get a story in my mind that I can't let go. And um, I do always have a list. I'm always collecting sort of ideas and, and sometimes ideas like this one actually are kind of kicking around in my brain for a few years before I finally kind of have my angle into them. But um yeah, it's it's uh, not there's not an exact science to it, I suppose. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we first met in person, you were in Missouri researching Helen Stevens, known as the Fulton Flash in Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, I remember you had a picture of her running shoes and we talked mm -hmm. about how fun the research process could be. So I'm interested in hearing any exciting research moments you had while researching the Angels of the Pacific. Well, this book did not disappoint from a research standpoint. Uh, uh, first of all, there are fascinating sources out there available through, you know, libraries, you know, through reading and um, pictures are really astonishing um, of World War II, including video. But I did go to the Philippines to research this book and I went, um, which is now unbelievable to me, but I went in February of 2020. So I really cut it under the wire. Um, as the trip neared and we knew that COVID was out there, I went to my local hospital that runs travel clinics and um, the, the services that they'll look at your itinerary and give you any medications you'll need. and. Um, given where I was going, they prescribed me with malaria medicine and a couple of other things. And I remember saying like, so what about this whole COVID or the coronavirus? I don't even remember what we were calling it back then, the coronavirus. Um, and they said, well, you're not going to China. You're not getting on a cruise ship. You'll be fine. And I really look back on that and I think, oh my gosh, what we... <laughs> so naive. We were so naive. Oh boy. Oh boy. You, you all have no idea what's coming. Um, but I did go. I think I left like February 19th. And while I was there, I also brought my 16 year old daughter as part of our big adventure. Um, and it was a great adventure. I have to say, thank God the trip worked out. I learned mm -hmm. so much. And there were some things I really wanted to see firsthand while I was there. And I was able to do everything I wanted. At the end of the trip, we had planned to spend several days in Japan, both as a little research, but also just for fun. I'd never been to Japan. And the night before we were flying from Manila to Japan, to Tokyo, um, Japan announced it was sh shutting down its schools. And I just, I knew we had been walking a very delicate line. Um, and I, my husband from his end here in Seattle managed to make phone calls to the airlines and, and we only ended up spending 24 hours in Japan. We had to cut that portion of our trip short and we came home. But um, that trip was amazing because I had never been to the Philippines and um, I needed to see it firsthand to really understand what I was working with. Um, I needed to see particularly Corregidor, which is an island that plays a big part of the story. Um, it's a fortified island right at the mouth of Manila Bay, which has been a fortified island for centuries. But um, I think, you know, early in the 1900s, this whole underground fortress was built of all these tunnels. And that's where the U.S. Army ended up kind of camping out for several months. The nurses spent time there. And I just couldn't picture. I, I really needed to see this place. And it didn't disappoint. It was fascinating. And so I, I do really, I'm so grateful that that trip worked out uh, on so many levels, but, mm -hmm. but it was a, a critical part of my research. And it also really, I met a wonderful historian there, uh, this woman who ended up being such an important part of my book because she not only answered so many questions for me over email in the months that followed, the years that followed really, 
working on it, she gave me all kinds of great suggestions to improve the story. And um, we've remained in touch. She just, I couldn't have written parts of that book without her help. And I met her there um, through some, another mutual author friend. So I'm just really grateful on so many levels that that trip worked out. So this is your fourth novel. Yes. You are a debut author in 2017, if I did my math correctly. Yes, yes. Um, if you could go back in time and give 2015 you or 2014 you advice, what would you say? Or what advice do you have for aspiring authors who don't yet have an agent or a publishing contract? I mean, I think, first of all, I'd give the advice that I think a lot of other writers would give, which is to stick with it. Um, you just kind of never know what series of events are going to align that will bring you to that lucky break. Um, and, and so, you know, I think for a lot of us who write um, fiction and, and probably nonfiction too, but it's something we have to do to sort of make sense of the world in many ways. And so I, I don't, I'm just grateful um, that I felt that compulsion. I mean, I had no idea mm -hmm. while working on the other Alcott that that would become anything beyond something that just lived on my laptop. So I'm forever grateful that I was sort of um, stubborn enough to stick with it, kind of clueless enough to stick with it. And also just that I wanted to work on it kind of no matter what happened. And, and then I just kind of got the lucky break of it actually being picked up. Um, but yeah, so I guess sort of just a, a fingers crossed and sort of hopeful attitude is, is the best I can give to any writer, um, because there are so many great stories out there and so many readers are just hungry for them. Mm -hmm. I always say authors are the best people to follow for book recommendations. You guys get to read books long before book bloggers or the everyday reader. Um, so I'm always scouring your social media accounts to see what books I need to put on my list. So can you tell us a bit about your reading world right now? What do you like to read and what books would you recommend? Well, I have been all over the place with my reading um, by design. I, I, first of all, I'm really into happy endings at the moment. Um, a certain lightness of spirit. <laughs> Aren't we well. all? <laughs> um, so I, I've been reading almost sort of like romantic comedies lately. Um, and yet the flip side of that is I've also been reading really dark thrillers. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm, I really am all over the place. Um, some books I've really enjoyed. Well, I, I really think my favorite book of 2021, and, and this is historical fiction. So here I am like looping it right back to what I always, you know, read the most. Uh, Still Life by Sarah Winman. I absolutely adored that book. Um, and it's beautifully written. It's everything about it is wonderful. So I would highly encourage readers to look for that. Um, and a real departure from that, I really enjoyed S.A. Cosby's Razorblade Tears, which is really kind of hard hitting and, and filled with spicy language. You know, it's definitely not for everyone. I really, I listened to an audio version that is so well done. I could not stop listening to that. Um, at the moment, I'm reading a couple of galleys, uh, which, you know, are books that will be coming out in the next few months. I'm reading Jillian Cantor's new book, uh, uh, Beautiful mm -hmm. Fools, because we have an event coming up uh, where I'll be interviewing her next month. And I'm read. then I have Sarah Ackerman's newest book, where she tends to write historical fiction set in Hawaii. And I mm -hmm. love her books. And I love the idea of escaping Hawaii, <laughs> even if it's just a mental escape. So um I'm really looking forward to that. I, I've loved Sarah's others, but others, her other books, sorry. <laughs> so that one will be a fun one. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, as I said, I'm kind of, oh, and then I had recently just also finished this one's sitting right here. So that one's easy. Um, we're able to get in the screen. Woman on Fire by Lisa Barr. Really enjoyed that one too, which I think um, I actually had thought it was historical fiction. She corrected me that it's, it's, it's present day set about an art theft. Um, from World War II. So I wasn't maybe totally nuts when I thought it was historical fiction. It draws on history, but that one was a really fast paced book that I really enjoyed as well. And I have to ask, can you tell us anything about your work in progress, which amazing woman in history we'll get to mm -hmm. read about soon or what time period you're focusing on at this time, anything? Right. Well, okay. So the book I'm working on now is a little bit different from 
my others. Um, and it's, it's not about any particular uh, famous woman or not famous woman. It is completely fictional. I, I think of, I mean, Angels of the Pacific was a book I worked on through sort of the darkest days of the pandemic. This new book is very much a response to the pandemic <laughs> where it's completely my own imagination. You know, I haven't really been doing a lot of travel lately. Um, so this one is just totally my own sort of world that I am building. Um, and it's about a mysterious collection of dollhouses. If that's mm -hmm. kind of, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I want to tell our listeners how they can find you. Your website is elisehooper.com. You're also at Elise Hooper on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook. They can find you at Elise Hooper author. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Oh, I mean, you know me, Ashley, I can talk for days. Yeah. Um, but no, I think you, you always um, ask great questions and I am just as I said, just excited to hopefully bring kind of a new angle into the World War II fiction that's so great out there. Um, I'm excited for this one to join the ranks and especially kind of shed some new light into the Pacific. Absolutely. I've read a ton of World War II books. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many historical fiction fans have, but there aren't a lot about uh, the Pacific. So I'm really excited that yeah. you took that unique angle on a um the time period that's been written about extensively. Yeah. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Well, Elise, it was such a pleasure chatting with you again today. I hope we get the opportunity opportunity to meet in person again. But in the meantime, it was lovely to get to catch up with you on this podcast and share your novel with our listeners. Great. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. And I really appreciate all the time and effort you put in to reading and, and giving a platform for authors um, to connect with readers. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure.